In the name of God, who is our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Amen. Amen. Being a native of Eastern Virginia and living most of my life here, I don't have a whole lot of experiences with with mountains. Now, I have crossed mountains. I, I do know where they are and how to behave around mountains, but the most common experience I have is about two hours west of here. It's only an hour and a half if you try to get to a pregame party at UVA or James Madison, but for most of us who drive like sane people, it's about two hours away. Crossing Afton Mountain, you cross between the central part of Virginia and the Shenandoah Valley. And my experience is with that one place, that's the place you may know that where the, the lights are on the side of the highway so when it's foggy you won't run off the mountain or into the side of the mountain because fog is one of those conditions there. But my common experience with that mountain is going to Shrine Monitor, someplace west. And usually it's later in the day when I leave here and so crossing over I often get to see Waynes, Waynesboro and maybe even Elkton or Harrisonburg, the lights of the Shenandoah Valley all twinkling below, and I'm reminded of the word Shenandoah means daughter of the stars. And I just pause for a second. And even though they're man-made lights, it reminds me of just the majesty of, of being in that place. It also recalls to memory a time when I was living in the Shenandoah Valley and had taken a job at William & Mary, and I would go home on the weekends to fix up the house that we were trying to sell and then come back and work at 8 o'clock in the morning, and I would cross the mountain like at 5.30 in the morning, coming to the east. And I remember those mornings with the sun rising across the whole, the commonwealth, and that just ethereal light coming in, the clouds just barely lifting and the whole commonwealth of Virginia just rolling out like waves across the ocean. And I recall those mornings as being just magical. At times I would turn the radio off and just sort of breathe in deeply the sight before me. It's those mountains that we cross, that, like the mountain that we have today in the gospel, that give us those moments to sort of just take our breath away a little bit. And mountains are places which divide. They are often used as lines. And not just between Nelson County and Augusta County, but sometimes nations and states are divided at lines. Geography, even if without political divisions, often the watershed goes in two different places toward two different oceans or bodies of water when you cross a mountain. And so it's appropriate that today, as we get to this last Sunday of, Lent, of Epiphany, the season where we have been seeing images of Jesus being revealed, sort of building up our knowledge week by week, by experience by experience, we now get to this mountaintop experience. We prepare ourselves to enter into a new phase of church life. We begin Lent this week, and their stories will change, taking our focus from one body to another, but all within the same storyline. When Jesus goes up the mountain with Peter and James and John, they have that ethereal moment. The cloud comes down. Jesus is dazzling white like Chlorites could never hope to do. And they see these two images of Elijah and Moses. And I think the words there that strike me the most is, Peter didn't know what to say. I mean, how truthful is that? You get to these moments sometimes I turn off the radio or I stop talking and I get to those moments like, you know, I don't even know what to say right now. This moment is taking place so magically, so ethereal, so mysteriously that the words that I would say would be poor attempts to try to capture what's going on here. I don't need to understand it all. And I think that's one thing that we are to understand about this transfiguration, that the mystery of the God who loves us, creates us, the mystery of the God who is revealed to us in the acts and person of Jesus Christ, the mystery of the God who will go down into Jerusalem, who will suffer persecution, who will die, the mystery of all that doesn't need to be unraveled for us to understand that it's something magical, something wonderful, something that we can experience. We don't need to try to put words to it. And we love mysteries. 
I mean, look at all the books that come out. Agatha Christie, James Patterson, Patty Procopi, Kathy Klein, all these mystery writers that we just eat up and we love the mysteries. But I would suggest to you that we like those mysteries because we get to solve them. And perhaps we don't get to solve the mystery of this God who loves us, creates us, and redeems us in quite the same way. We see Peter trying to do that. Let me make a tent here, God. That will help things out. And he's get this little slap on the wrist. No, no, just live into the mystery. And that's what we're called to do. Now, I could easily stop talking right here and let's say, let's just be mysterious Christians and live into this. But then you'd leave and say, he's just like Peter. He didn't know what to say, did he? So let me lit res up one point for you. It's that voice that comes out of the cloud. This is my son, my beloved, listen to him. In Mark's gospel, we're going to hear something very much like that only three times. One of them actually comes up next week. So if you have deja vu next week, understand that. It takes place at Jesus' baptism, where Jesus goes into the waters to be baptized, and from above, there's a dove that appears, and there's a voice that says, You are my son, my beloved. The text doesn't tell us if anyone else hears that, but we're clear it's there and that Jesus hears it. And then at the end of the gospel story in Mark, we're going to hear the centurion look up at the cross and remark about Jesus, truly this was the Son of God. That identification of Jesus as the Son of God only happens these three times in Mark's gospel. And that should be a clue to us to think about what happens in this moment of transfiguration as being connected to the identity of Christ at his baptism and the identity of Christ at his crucifixion. That somewhere in becoming incarnate and taking on the work of, of redemption of the world is how we are to understand this mystery of transfiguration, this person of Jesus appearing with these two big figures from the Old Testament. But this stage, this phrase rather, has something the other two don't. That little zinger, listen to him. Listen to what he says. And so I thought about that. And I pulled off the shelf my mother's Bible. Now, nowadays Bibles don't have this, but when she was given this Bible, and it's old and ragged, it was a red letter Bible. Red letter Bibles, for those of you who are not shaking your head, are those, there was a version of the Bible printed where most things were in black, but whatever Jesus says was in red. And so I could go through and look at what did Jesus say if I want to listen to him, not just hear those words, but try to listen to him, what those words tell us. And there's a whole lot that in the Gospel of Mark Jesus is telling us. First of all, he's telling us a, a lot of parables, how the kingdom of God is and how we are to behave in those parables. But in our church setting, there are some things that Jesus are telling us that I think we should hear and abide. Recently, we've heard him say, come, follow me. That invitation, that way of how do we set our lives not just as normal mountain-crossing experiences, but times when we can see the person of Jesus, we can try to follow him as best we can in the mysteries. We heard him say to the widow, to the mother-in-law of Simon Peter, get up, rise up. We also hear this commonly when he heals a man and says, pick up your mat and follow me. Or to his disciples, take up your cross, deny yourself and follow me. Hearing those words gives us a sense of we're not allowed just to stay back and hear the words of Jesus as if it's a show on HBO and watch the credits roll by. We have to get up and, and do things about our faith. Our faith is one that requires our, our hands and feet, our actions, not just our cognizant admission of things. Jesus tells us these things to go out and be the world. He tells his disciples when they are gathered around with a group of 5,000, and they say, you know, Jesus, it's getting pretty late here. Maybe you should send everybody away to get something to eat. Hangry is not a good scene. 
And Jesus says to them, you give them something to eat. How are the ways that we are to hear these words and give the world that is hungry for love, for justice, for peace, for bed, for food, for shelter, something to eat to satisfy their soul? What are those ways that we understand God and then do the work of God, listen to the words of God? The baptism, the crucifixion, the transfiguration. In all of these, we have a very clear picture of who Jesus is. And yet, it is still a mystery. We can sit back and try to solve the mystery, and I tell you, we won't get any clear answers. We'll get no more answers than James, John, and Peter do as they go down the mountain and still wonder, what was he talking about? What does that mean about dying? However, they continued to follow. They continued to listen. They continued to do the work. And as we cross the mountains of our life, as we pause in those moments that take our breath away, it means that we are then empowered to go and do the work, to go down into the depths of the valley, that we may experience God and rise again with God in his presence. May God bless you in this season of Lent, where we've learned about the season of Epiphany, where we learned about the experience of God in Lent, as we continue on the journey of God, and as you listen to what our Lord and Savior says and how that impacts the ministries that you are called to. Amen.